Hey friends, Dave Hagen here. We've got a guest in the studio today. We're going to spend some time talking with him. He's a bankruptcy attorney here in Los Angeles. Stay tuned because it's really interesting. That's today on the Financial Wellness Podcast. Welcome to the Financial Wellness Podcast, Dave's weekly message to keep you on your path to the financial success. Here is your host, financial problem solver and talk show host, Dave Hagan. Hey, Nick. Hey, welcome, everybody. We're at Uncle Studios in beautiful downtown Van Nuys. I've got uh, Brian Reed with me in the studio here today. How's it going, Dave? It's going good, Brian. Thanks for being here. And today we got a guest, actually one of our first guests, uh, David P. Jacob, he's in the bankruptcy attorney here in the Los Angeles area. I've known David for oh, probably about 10 years. He used to appear in front of me when I was doing hearings on bankruptcy matters back when I was a trustee. And um, I really enjoyed uh, when he would be the attorney of record in the case, when he would appear because it was calm, it was collected, the client was thoroughly prepared. Um, he dealt with people in a very respectful way, sometimes with a lot of people. I don't know how he kept it all straight. And uh, so an appearance where he was appearing was a, a breath of fresh air. Recently, I bumped into him and I thought, wow, why don't we get some of his unique perspective in the bankruptcy system? I thought it would be of interest to some of our uh, listeners. And as we prepared for this show and the, and the more we talked, I, I thought this would uh, uh, be so interesting as we started to uh, develop the information that uh, Dave has uh, to bring to us today. So David appears on behalf of attorneys with their clients at the first meeting of creditors and in bankruptcy matters. You, you know, sometimes you'd show up and do hmm, 10 clients at a time. I mean, back to back to back. So I think he's got a lot of experience in dealing with people going through the system and maybe even the bankruptcy system itself. So David, good to have you here today. Thanks, David. Let me ask you this. How many years have you been appearing with clients in bankruptcy proceedings? It's been 10 years. 10 long years, huh? Very long. Uh, how many hearings have you attended, say, over this like 10-year period? Um, ap approximately 20,000 hearings. 20,000 hearings in 10 years. Wow. All right. And, you know... We, we always go for the, we always want to talk about the statistical record, right? Uh, any idea, what was your biggest day? How many hearings did you do on your biggest day? Before I came here, I was just thinking about that, and it was 68 hearings in one day. 68. <laughs> <laughs> How do you keep that all straight, huh? And that was definitely just one rough, long day. Wow. Now, <laughs> let me ask you this. Um, you know, I, I knew you were always prepared. You always knew the people. How do you how do you go about preparing for something like that? I tried to be prepared for yeah. sixty eight hearings. Um, wow! And um, at times you're just doing triage, in a way like a like an emergency room. You're taking the people that have the most issues first and working with them first, then moving down the line. Wow! Wow! And a lot of the people, as I seem to recall, maybe not even um, um, English speaking. Yeah, and I didn't know any Spanish until I started okay. my job. No, nope. <laughs> just no bankruptcy Spanish, which is kind of um, hilarious. No grammar whatsoever, but um, in a way, it simpler might have actually been better. People actually understood me instead of um, ignoring all the legalese I was trying to impart on their on them. You learn from hearing. experience. Exactly. Well, wow, you could have fooled me. I mean, I remember back in the day, I mean, uh, it seemed like you were communicating with folks pretty well and getting the people in the seat and getting them prepared pretty well. And so I guess that uh, uh, abbreviated, shortened version of uh, Spanish, you know, worked out, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And Tell me about the process a little bit. So someone someone says, hey, uh, Dave, Dave Jacob's going to be there and he's going to uh, be with you at the hearing. Um, what would what would that be like? Um, when you're um, going to a meeting of creditors, um, usually you're coming into a location that has a lot of government um, accoutrements, shall we say, like American flag, DOJ seal on the wall, the FBI sign, which is sort of very important. It actually... And, um, in, and intimidating. Yes, and it's uh, never underestimate the power of the FBI sign. Um, <laughs> I think sometimes I want one in my office just to make sure people are telling the truth. And most of the time, the people that are asking questions are called trustees, um, either the United States trustee or the Chapter 7 trustee, which is what we're talking about. And 
um, just to confuse everybody. And even sometimes creditors actually show up to the meeting of creditors. So that's sort of normally who's asking questions. And so when they, when they get there, their name is on a list, and then, and then what, what do you do with them? How does that work? So um, if, if people are showing up on time, which is a big if as well, um, we, go over, we go over sort of what they already know. I tell everyone, you already know this already. I'm just doing review, but I'm just trying to calm you down. You see the American flag and DOJ seal, um, and you're very nervous. So let's get you back to sort of um, understanding why everybody's here and the various players, the Chapter 7 trustees' motivations. On the one hand, kind of like a judge enforcing the code. On the other hand, looking to see, can they find something to sell? Can they take your stuff? And and it is called liquidation, but as a human being, you get to keep some stuff up to a certain limit, and that limit depends on the state where you live. And in California, you can keep a certain amount. And then when you're over the limits, you have to pay the trustee. That's kind of how that works. And if you're hiding money, you're going to have to pay the trustee. So, But most people aren't hiding money. Most people are telling the truth. Most people know the stuff they have. So um, it's really um, a very quick hearing once we get up there. But the preparation, um, sometimes I scare them because I'm asking more questions than the trustee is going to ask. But at the same time, um, it's better to be over-prepared than under yeah, I like to to think that, you know, over preparation is the the key to success in some of these things. You know, if if you're over prepared, you you invest the additional time that it was a little bit easier. Yeah, and um and I'd rather be wrong. I'd like see it was so easy. Way easier than when I was interrogating you. <laughs> <laughs> so, what what was it like for these people for the clients that were there? I mean, could you describe what what their reaction to the whole process was? Mostly scared and stressed out, and um, everyone wants to get out of there quickly, um, and they're frustrated that maybe they're not getting out of there as quickly. And um, in terms of the time you're staying there, most of the time, most people are just waiting for other people to get their hearings over with. And in our area, everybody sees everyone else's hearings. Um, we have a lot more bankruptcy hearings than other places in North Dakota. There's three a week versus, you know, us having at least 30, 40, 50 a day. So, um, so it is kind of an assembly line, um, process, um, for most people. And now, now once their hearing is called, how long does that, or their matter is called. I mean, how long does that typically last for most people? Usually a couple minutes. That's it? Yeah, I usually mean, a couple minutes. There's no, uh, you know, I remember back in the day there was a show, uh, L.A. Law, and they showed a hearing where the, the, the trustee asked the people for their credit cards, and she cut them up right in front of the whole group. <laughs> Did they do that anymore? <laughs> um, I've also heard that story actually was from a judge that used to, because um, or a referee before the new system came into effect and they had the judge's robe and took out the cards in front of everybody and cut them up. And, um, but that kind of judgment is usually not really, um, occurring in, in, in our district at least. Is it kind of a, a blame system at the hearing? Do, do they try and get people to like acknowledge their, uh, you know, their financial sins. failure, that kind of thing? Yeah, is there any kind of atonement like thing confession. going on or what? Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of the receptacle for the atonement. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and, I'm so sorry. It'll and never like, happen you know, again. you don't have to be sorry. This is not a judgment fest. We're just going to confirm what you know. Um, and sometimes um, since the chapter seven trustee is supposed to be sort of neutral too, um, you know, sometimes they're not going after the, the, the individual, they might be going after the law firm that's representing them, but they feel like it's an attack on them. So they get defensive on that, on that front, but really, um, calming down, you know, understanding what your situation is. If, if the trustee doesn't understand why you're here, if you're filing bankruptcy with, you know, the amount of debt or your situation or the amount of money you're earning, and we don't understand why you're here, then, your, then that's your chance to explain the pain. Otherwise, you know, you keep it short and simple and everyone's happy with the answers because you're answering just the question that's being asked. Now, when you talk with them after the, the hearing, I usually found that, uh, you know, when I would uh, appear with a client from time to time that there would be this, uh, you know, this, this huge relief. Do you, do you talk with them afterwards and did you experience that typically? Yes, most of the time it's relief and thank goodness it's over and what do I have to do now and when will I know when it's over? Is it over? Is it over now? N not, not technically no, but reality, yes. Um, just make sure you do that uh, personal financial management class. Otherwise, we have to 
reopen that case and pay more money. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember one time downtown, uh, this this client, this lady of mine, I said, "That's it, it's over," and she she bolted for the stairwell, and I could I could hear her, you know, running down the stairwell, going, "Oh my God, I'm free, I'm free," and I I really didn't realize what. What a relief it was uh, until I saw that for, for a lot of people. Even crying and just hugging me like I did something amazing. Or yeah. Well, like, that's because you did. The obvious thing to do. Yes, it was all me. I saved you. <laughs> uh, uh, you know what, though? If you can be, you know, play a small role um, in that process and helping them to get turned around, I guess, you know, what a rush. Do you, did you enjoy that? Do you enjoy that, that part of it? Yeah, um, those those times when when people really appreciated you, of course you love those times. That's that's great. I mean, that's a you know I I learned over a while to to appreciate those times. Uh, most of the time, it's like thank goodness we're done. And and on the attorney's end, I've got fifty billion more cases to go cover. I can't really dwell on this one, although I would like to have to keep moving. Now you seem like like you have a pretty. Um you know, calm de- demeanor. You, th- you think that that helped you in dealing with all these cases? I used to not have a calm demeanor. Most of the time it was, you know, stressing out. Um, but after a while, um, I sort of learned to be calmer. Also, you want to impart on, you know, as an, as an attorney, you want to um, be contagious in the calm direction because they're going to be nervous, they're going to be emotional, and you don't want to be the one catching the nervousness. You want to be the one sort of imparting calm and understanding what you're doing, right? And confidence, even though maybe inside you may not be confident, in person you want to be confident. Well, I mean, some of these uh, bankruptcy cases that you've appeared in, um, you look at the the paperwork either the night before or when have you, and you look at it and you go, whoa, I don't understand what's going on here. This is a mess. I mean, what's that like? That's got to be pretty frightening. Yeah, and, and that's when I'm learning to sort of keep it in, keep in the keep in the nervousness. Um, it, it, and you know, you talk to the client, um, and you, you also learn sort of to shorten up your interrogation in terms of what's important, what is typically going to be looked at by the chapter seven trustee or the United States trustee. Um, you can't find everything. There's some cases you just can't find everything, but what's most important? Are you hiding money? That's really the main focus. Like, is this person hiding money? Is this person not being truthful and honest with everyone in the office and with me at the hearing. And sometimes they're not truthful and honest, but they see the FBI sign and come to Jesus and then all of a sudden telling me a bunch of stuff or they see me in the suit and all of a sudden the truth is coming out now. Mm -hmm. And um, Do you ever lead them a little bit first with, you realize the trustee has your bank statements? Is there anything that you want to tell me that you perhaps haven't told anyone yet to try and get them over the edge of if they are still hiding something? Um, or I've do been, you just put it out there and go, hey, have you done everything? Have, I, you know, I've been fooled. I mean, people have fooled me like just the sweetest old man. You know, I, it actually was my case directly. Sweetest old man. Talked to him for hours. It was so wonderful. <laughs> But then you know, <laughs> then I get then I get a, a nice uh, phone call from the Chapter Seven trustee about real estate. Um, wow! And I had them sign risk statements fifty billion times, and mm-hmm. it, it didn't matter. The person was just, you know, amazing. Um, but most of the time, um, you know, sometimes the trustees have questionnaires and 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 that kind of thing. And and um, are you hiding any real estate from us? And they start laughing when I ask that question. Um, but most of the time, you know, but sometimes they, they remember, oh, wait, I, I signed some title document 10 years ago. Oh, okay. What you have, what you shocking, to, shocking that I at? just remembered right now after seeing the FBI sign. Yeah. So all of a sudden the FBI sign, or they hear other cases and um, it may not even be the debtor's fault. It may be the counsel or the people that aren't doing the good job in the office, not mm-hmm. asking the right questions either. So... It used to crack me up. They, someone would respond, uh, you know, I'd say, do you own any real estate? And they'd say, well, not in my name. And I'd say, well, <laughs> let's talk about what you do own that's maybe not in your name, you know? Or uh, they'd say, well, no assets in this country. Well, let's, let's pretend we're talking worldwide. What do you, what do you got that's worldwide? It's, it's really interesting to me sometimes what people are trying to 
you know, get away with. Um, I was I remembered once actually um, a case that was in front of you um, that was someone that was unrepresented, Uh-oh. and um, and you were one of the trustees that asked, "Do you own any real estate located anywhere in the world?" That was my anywhere question. In the world. That, that was, was my question. question. Yeah, that was yeah. your question, and not all the Chapter Seven trustees would ask that question, but this self-represented person said, "Oh yeah, there's a house in Israel that I you know." don't have in the papers, I guess, um, because he was representing himself. And you were, you know, had a great poker face. Didn't I didn't see the money signs in your eyes, but you were asking questions. And turns out, no problem finding a real estate agent in Israel or taking care of that. And people need to know that anywhere in the world is really actually anywhere in the anywhere world. It's in even the world. Though, And it's not that much more expenses, expensive for the Chapter 7 trustee to go after that. So it was, um, yeah, Israel. And you were wow. no problem. No problem. We're happy to sell it. Happy to do it. We're required to do under the code. You know, now I guess with Elon Musk and his mission to Mars, I would change that to anywhere in the universe. <laughs> 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 oh, man. I don't remember, I don't remember that case. I'm, I'm impressed that you remember that, David. Um, all right. So if you've looked at 20,000 cases, I mean, you've seen a huge, huge slice of, of people going through bankruptcy. Are there any kind of general causes of bankruptcy or any wisdom or knowledge that you could Im- impart to our listeners in terms of, you know, the kind of information or knowledge or, or, or insight that, that you've gained? What are, what are the general causes of bankruptcy? Any thoughts on that? Well, the, the real base is the credit cards. That's really sort of the, the kernel of, the, of most people's problems. And then, um, the, which you, one of your um, advice that I heard you um, say was sort of the emergency fund, not, you know, having an emergency fund. And um, a lot of people just don't have the emergency fund, but this credit card debt is killing them. And then one tiny um, event or not so tiny event pushes them over the edge to call the bankruptcy lawyer. But it seems to me the credit cards are um, maybe not the cause, but one of the, you know, one of the effects um, you know, people have some kind of issue and first place they go with the credit card. So, you know, it's almost like the credit card is the symptom, but not the cause. If we dig underneath the credit cards, any thoughts about what you saw causes of bankruptcy? So, um, the, they're, they're making their minimum payments. They're, they're living on the edge with the, with the, with the expenses. And then all of a sudden the car accident happens. The family member dies. The the unexpected expense happens and then they're calling the bankruptcy lawyer. But um, also other people avoid the issue trying to pretend it's not there and ignore the bills, ignore the mail. That's my other favorite. Ignore even the bankruptcy lawyer's advice (laughs) because they don't want to be confronted with their own failure. Um, ignore, well, I mean, I guess who, yeah. who, who does, right? Exactly. I mean, that's human nature. I get exactly. that. And being disorganized, that's really, um, being disorganized about, um, their own life generally. Um, and also why it's so hard to get people to follow instructions as well, trying to organize them. That's sort of what the bankruptcy process in a way, you know, as an attorney, bankruptcy attorney being more than just about bankruptcy, but about the whole financial life. Right. Right, right. Well, and I and I tell people, you know, in the office, hey, if if folks really had it together, they probably wouldn't have any financial problems, or may not, and and wouldn't need us. We'd be, we'd be out doing something else. We'd be you know, designing computer software or something, you know. And most people aren't just running up a bunch of credit cards and filing bankruptcy. Um, although we remember those people, <laughs> right? Who buy the Ferrari and then file bankruptcy. So we remember those people. But. Yeah, we'll see you again in eight years. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, the other thing that occurred to me is that, um, you know, back when we were talking about you know, some of the different kinds of things that we saw or the unique things that we saw, I mean, those are the, those are the anomalies, aren't they? I mean, those are the, you know, the different case, the, the funny case, the outrageous case, the problematic case. That's what you remember. What you don't remember are all the other cases, all of the other just people in a jam looking for a fresh start. Yeah, and the honest and truthful people and, you know, trying to tell myself, look, don't remember the insane person that didn't know what was going on right. or had whatever problem, you know, this. And at the same time, I remind all the clients, look, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence by going through all these kind of basic questions again, or I'm not trying to um, judge you or, or you know, 
that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. This is just based on experience with people that didn't follow instructions, people that um, were hiding money, people that had lots of tr- lots of problems. Now, I'll put you on the spot a little bit. If you had to assign a percentage of all the people that you've seen going through the system, whether you, your clients or your appearances or someone else's attorney or someone else's client, what percentage of the people do you think are, you know, telling the truth? 95%. 95? Okay, that's a, that's a pretty good number. I mean, there's going to be some rotten apples in any barrel, but uh, 95% telling the truth, just trying to get by. Yes. Okay, okay, that's interesting. Um, you know, another thing that I was thinking about, I was looking, thinking back to Elizabeth Warren's book, The Two Income Trap, and uh, a lot of our listeners may go, Elizabeth Warren, who did... That's the uh, senator from uh, uh, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Yeah. Yeah. What is she writing a book? Well, most people don't realize that before she was a a politician, she was a a professor at Harvard. And she would do um, empirical studies on bankruptcy. In fact, she was a bankruptcy professor. Um, And and, and one of the thesis or themes of her book, if you will, was that bankruptcy was usually caused by one of... Uh, three different causes, uh, dissolution, medical bills, or, or job loss. Does that, uh, with your experience, does, does that sound right, fair, accurate, inaccurate? What do you think? Um, I, I agree with that, but, the, but that's what's putting, it, putting the people over the edge. To build the mountain to get to the, over the edge is the credit cards or sort of the mountain that's the base of that. Right. Why those three things are, ha- are putting people into bankruptcy is because of the because the credit cards form the sort of the the foundation right. of pain. So people experience one of these one or two or three of these issues, and the first thing they do is go to the credit cards, and then the credit cards gang up on them, and before they know it, the mountain's falling down on them. Or they had the credit cards already. Already, and, and this is the, and then okay. the, then the job loss happened. Okay. The tipping point. Right, right. So and they no were, emergency fund. So they were already a little uh, on edge, and then uh, one of these three things puts them over. So, you know, we were talking, and it occurred to us that between Dave Jacob, Dave Hagen, and and Brian Reed, we've seen about 60,000 cases collectively going through the Los Angeles area, which makes you mostly tired, tired, you know. Um, But I was thinking with with that large a sampling of, of cases, what uh, what kind of lessons can we lay out there for people from from what we've seen, uh, David? Any thoughts? So um, the people are on a tightrope because of the credit cards. The credit cards forms the tightrope they're walking on, and then a light breeze just sort of topples them over into bankruptcy. Okay. Okay. Brian, any thoughts? I'm just gonna echo that that light breeze. It's all it takes is one thing. So you've got to get yourself into the position like from your last podcast you got to be in that 28 percent or whatever it is that is 100 percent, you know prepared for a breeze maybe not eight breezes in a row no one can be prepared for that and that's what bankruptcy is for eight breezes that, that kind of a circumstance yeah yeah but i think that we you know we we see more and more people are maybe accepting a little more financial risk in their life than they should and then the breeze comes along you know, um, one of the things that I was thinking about was, you know, most of these cases aren't usually caused by a, a big spending spree. It's just a little bit too much chronic negative cash flow, I like to say, over a long period of time that builds up. And before people know it, they turn around and go, wow, I can't. How did it get that big how did so it get fast? That big? Yeah. And one of the things that we harp on on the on the podcast is. No debt, no debt, reduce debt, make big, huge, hairy payments to reduce debt, reduce debt, reduce debt, so that if something comes along, you're better able to uh, survive that. I mean, is that kind of a theme that you see, Dave? Exactly. That's well, that's what I'm, you know, just one repair shouldn't put you um, on the phone with the bankruptcy lawyer. It right. shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be just, you know, something that usually would have been small, but for the huge credit card debt that person's, you know, living with. Exactly. And that's the tightrope I was talking about. Right. What about uh, the craziest thing you ever saw? We're, we're running out of time here, but I got okay, it. Okay, so, yeah, so someone this. has, I mean, there there was um, on Facebook, this person had a bunch, it was, you know, posing with Ferraris and Lamborghinis and a Rolex and 
and the Louis Vuitton bag and all this thing and all these kind of things. And the trustee did their homework, the Chapter 7 trustee, and went on Facebook and saw a lot of these pictures of the <laughs> debtor with the Ferrari and the Lamborghini and, and the Rolex Daytona and whatnot. And... Um, held I, property, held I, property. I could see all the, you know, the the money signs in the eyes of the of the of the Chapter Seven trustee, and um, that was a nice long interrogation session. I enjoyed watching. Um, the excuse the debtor made was basically he's a model, not really owning all that stuff. Um, but um, it was it was a fun one. Another one was a huge diamond ring that um, the lady was showing off on Facebook and Twitter and and all that and. And then listing it in the papers for two thousand dollars, but clearly that was not worth two thousand dollars. It was worth probably like a home, um, and not exemptable. But um, that was a, that hearing settled very quickly. Wow, <laughs> Brian, <laughs> your wildest story? Oh, there's too many. Um, I can't really tell you my wildest one. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> you it's, don't have the time. It, it's not for. Well, Brian, while you're thinking about it, I gotta. I gotta tell mine. This is one of my favorite stories. Um, a lady was, uh, you know, in front of me. I was the trustee, and her paperwork said that she was uh, an entertainer. And um, you know, I said to her, "Well, I see on your list of business expenses, five hundred dollars a month for supplies." And I'm just kind of wondering, what kind of supplies does an entertainer need for like five hundred a month? And she says. I'm an exotic dancer. And I said, next case. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I just didn't know how to respond to that. Or, you know, or one time I'm sitting in the, the hearing room downtown and, um, it, you know, it used to be like, there'd be like 200 people at a time in this big room and we're sitting there and my client leans over to me and he says, do you think it would be a problem if I was carrying a, a piece in here? And I said, why don't you go outside to the parking lot and take care of whatever problem you might have there? Because that frightens me half to death. Oh my gosh. I mean, you can't do that anymore. You can't do that anymore no, with all of the metal, uh, detectors metal detectors and everything detectors, else. But... And if the metal detector goes off, the guys will all jump on you and you know, you, you get some handcuffs. Is that a viable it. reason for missing your 341A meeting? What did you, that you're carrying a piece? I was trying to carry a piece in through security and got arrested. Yeah. I don't, I don't think the trustee would be too sympathetic about that, you know? That's going to be a post-petition debt anyway, so. <laughs> All right, Brian, any wild stories or I'll, let's close it you out? know, just be careful um, if anyone is thinking about filing bankruptcy and you have angry friends, family members, stuff like that, they will call us. Um, we got a call up for one case. I don't think it was when it was... Ex wives. Oh, yeah. Used to love ex spouses coming in. Oh, yeah. They call Good you up stuff. and they let you know stuff. We There was an attorney who filed bankruptcy, and it was his former paralegal that tipped us off on the fact that he, had, he was going to get paid um, for services that had already been rendered pre petition with uh, a piece of land that was sitting somewhere else. And, and the paralegal knew about it because he was there and he was also a creditor in the case. So if you have friends or family that know stuff about you and you make them angry, they will be calling the trustee if you file bankruptcy. Well, or or the way to obviate all of that is just tell the truth, which is the vast majority of the cases, yeah. you know. So what's our takeaway on this? Because we could talk about this for hours. Um, one, bankruptcies usually involve credit cards, but it's the result of uh, too much debt or... or um, as a result of uh, debt arising because of dissolution, illness, job loss, um, usually bankruptcy involves people in a good people in a bad spot. Almost always, I think Dave said, uh, what ninety five percent. Yes, and and most importantly, Dave Jacobs says, don't live on the edge because a light breeze can push you off. This is Dave Hagen, and you've been listening to the Financial Wellness Podcast. You've been listening to the Financial Wellness Podcast, Dave's weekly message to keep you on your path to financial success. If you have a question that you would like Dave to answer on the podcast, go to thefinancialwellnesspodcast.com. You can leave an audio message with one click of a button or type your message into the question box. Either way, it's sent right to Dave's phone. Remember, 
Dave will randomly draw from the submitted questions and pick the winner of a free one hour personal conversation with Dave to help you achieve your financial goals. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you receive the new episode notifications or share the podcast via the app with your family and friends. This is your announcer, Nick Appel, wishing you every financial success.